a beautiful mess. A beautiful mess. Yeah. Life is a beautiful mess. A beautiful mess. Yes. Life is a beautiful mess. A beautiful mess. I'm trying, I'm crying, I feel like I'm dying. I'm doing my best. All right. Welcome back to Being Human and Other Shit. Uh, I, first off, we would just want to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Miwok people. We acknowledge them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Um, today, we have a very special episode with uh, our co-host, my, my beautiful, beautiful co-host, hey, Stacy, hey, hey, hey. and her brother, Vince. Um, and we are going to be talking about... Um, alcoholism, addiction, um, the sudden death of their father, Mm -hmm. and really living through the aftermath of that. So also the Vince that I talk about in every episode. This is the ginger Vince. This is Vince. So. <laughs> Hi guys. Hi everybody. I'm the guy. Um, so let's just kick it off. If if whoever wants to start, just go. Stacy probably can take mm-hmm. the lead here. Just your background, the, the normal like kick off how we usually do um, the background, and then we'll really get into the spilling the tea. Cool, cool. Um, well, my dad was first gen, born. In Ray, I think he was born in French camp. Yep. Somebody's gonna watch this and be like, "All these facts are fucking wrong." But yeah. what, from yeah. what he told us, we don't us, have a fact check, so yeah. we're just gonna have yeah. to yeah. trust from you. From what he told us, he was born in French camp at the county hospital, mm-hmm. raised in a campo, um, was a maintenance man. I think most of his life. Um, mechanic as well. Mechanic as well. Master, or he's a welder. Yeah, very good with his hands. Mm-hmm. Always tinkering around. Never really wanted to like sit down and and um, you know watch a bunch of TV and do that shit super animated i mean like we covered in the last episode a big character yep. i always like to tell people that um i always think about his life like the movie the big fish where i think my brother can say like he always told us these stories that were like okay i remember as i got older and was a teenager like sure like blah 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 and then his funeral happens and it's like oh shit like these people are all at his funeral mm-hmm. and this is all real and i think even at the time the funeral at home actually said it was the largest funeral they've ever yeah. had oh my god people goodness. were standing outside looking in the window looking in the funeral. windows Did, like fucking, were there some good stories at his funeral or i don't even remember it was really such a blur like i i uh not really i, I mean a couple but maybe but it was just mostly just kind of sad yeah how old were each of you when he passed i was, I was 19 22. no you're 24 because I, I was 19 okay. Yeah, I was. I actually still lived here um, at the time, and my brother had just, I think, or maybe. No, I was, I there, I was there for I think a couple years. Okay, yeah, because yeah. you moved when you were like twenty one. I think I moved when I was twenty two. Yeah. Yeah. So, so okay. he had been in Orange County a couple years um, after he passed, and then um, I moved. I think almost two months to the day to Santa Barbara, like because of that reason, it was like kind of like I'm out of here. Um, but yeah, he was just big character, big Pre- person, big spirit big yeah like got the party started he's i I wanted to kind of tell this story because i think it's funny but my brother and i were just invited to a family wedding a saucita family wedding and um my cousin april was nice enough to include us probably on behalf of my dad you know and Mm -hmm. and i had a couple people tell me like oh if your dad was here he would have been pulling you out to the dance floor already like back in the 90s we had these like epic family parties family weddings where everybody and their kids were invited it was like 300 plus and you always knew it was about to get cracking when they started rolling the tables away from the dance floor to like create room because there's so many people and he was always the first one out there i've like multiple pictures of him and i some he snapped of us like dancing in these like hideous 90s outfits they used to put yeah those sweaters bad right remember when we used to go to like we're bringing them back dude (laughs) my dad would always take us like we like i said we were not never really in the house so we would do like a Friday night, um, like pizza night or whatever. I remember graduate, we would go to the graduate all the time. The graduate, we would go to. I remember for like oh, a yeah. short period of time, we would go to Pietro's. That mm-hmm. was a thing. So, uh, what was Shakey's? Shakey's Pizza. Because he'd always sing karaoke. He'd always do karaoke and <laughs> yep. sing You Lost That Loving Feeling. Yep. That was like his song. Shout out Top Gun. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so he would, he was big. You know, he had a big, big personality. And like um, our cousin mentioned on the last podcast, one of her cousins actually named their, and not even a first cousin of ours, named her son after him. He just, he impacted a lot of people and, and we lost him like way too soon. Yeah. You know? I don't think the apple falls far from the tree because you just explained the both of you. Yeah, right? <laughs> I think yeah. your dad. Yeah. I definitely think we got, my mom's funny, but my dad was funny. Yeah, he was yeah. funny. 
funny and light and always was like into you know what was his thing he made everybody feel special he made everybody feel special mm-hmm. i mean he would do things like bring a rose to all my theas and my grandma Aww. on mother's day yeah. so they all felt well you know like happy and like that was their day and somebody's was- yard took a hit that day no, <laughs> he didn't buy. He that didn't shit. buy those. Yeah, he didn't buy those, <laughs> dude. Speaking yeah. of just stealing somebody's <laughs> flowers, remember my grandparents still live in the house he grew up in in Acampo. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and he would literally. I don't. This always kills me. I would tell people this, like, sorry for the farmers this impacted, but he would literally pull over on the side of the road and make my brother and I run and get pick grapes. Yeah, come on, to, come on, hurry up. Yeah, hurry and like honk if like someone was coming. Like, go get grapes off the vineyards and like come back. In oh the my car. gosh! And then he would we'd always eat them frozen. That was like his thing. <laughs> Yeah, so we're eating these like wine grapes. Yeah, yeah, wine grapes. Right <laughs> Dude, just, just, just funny. When he would ever want like threaten us, he for me at least he'd always be like, "I'm gonna go left instead of right and drop you off at the river with Yorona if you keep it up all day." <laughs> and I would always be like, "Damn, like I really was scared. I'm about to like the crying lady's about to take me," you know. Yep. So yeah, just big personality. You know, very very big impact I think on a lot of people besides us. Yeah. Do you like growing up? I know hindsight is tw- always twenty twenty, uh, but growing up, did you guys know and recognize that he was an addict? Or I'm gonna let had- my brother take that one. You're uh, older than me. I uh, well, it was just kind of like how I grew up thinking that's how you were supposed to be because yep. that's that's what I knew. Like I didn't yeah. I didn't know that there was a problem, you know, because mm. from a young age, you know, you have the the arguing, the late nights, you know, the, the cloud of smoke always above your head, that mm-hmm. smell of a party. Like, yeah. I know the smell. I remember, like, I know that smell of a party when it's hap- when it's about to happen. Like, it's in the air. It's weird. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, okay, things Like, the to- first time you actually smoked weed as, like, a teenager, that was for me. Like, oh, this smells like my dad's ashtray in his, in his yeah. El Camino. That's so crazy, yeah. right? Yeah. It Golf- starts clicking. You're like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, you take me golfing when I was a kid, and I swear, I thought golfing was carrying a background while your dad went in the bushes for a couple seconds and hit the pipe that was that was golfing for me he would golf i was just his caddy when and i would hold his weed for him you know it's like no and and i actually tell the story to a lot of people where like i don't think i had i mean yeah it's like looking back you know the physical abuse with my mom the affairs all the the obviously negative stuff that comes with um having an addiction and not being in your right state of mind right that stuff now as an adult i'm like okay or as i became an adult i was like what the hell it was also too like i can't ever remember a time being in the car with him if my stepmom wasn't in the car that he he did not have a tall can Mm -hmm. he was always drinking in the cup holder i would remember him like you know my parents separated from me when i was like i always say like four or five i was in kindergarten so that age four or five because i was four in kindergarten just got in there early i was like 11 yeah so yeah and we're five years apart so it was about so maybe i was like six but I remember um, he would pick us up. He had every other weekend. That was his visits. And I remember him picking us up in his El Camino. And if it was just him and he would turn the corner from my mom's. And I remember him opening like the min- the airplane minis mm-hmm. and he would slam it and throw it in the back of his, he would throw in the back of his El Camino. And what's That's funny, crazy. not funny, but when I inherited his El Camino and I cleaned it out, there was a, over a hundred E and J brandy, oh my gosh. E and J brandy bottles tucked behind that. like where the spare tire would go. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it was severe. It was severe. His alcoholism was just bad. My mom would always say, like, they got together super young. They were, like, best friends who got together when, like, 14. Had Vince when, I think, my mom was 17. My dad was 18. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that being teen parents um, on top of the responsibility of, like, my, I think my parents were the first ones to own a home. They got got voted in high school. You know how you get voted, like, categories? The Mm -hmm. most successful. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, and like, um, Nisi, get it. <laughs> mm-hmm. like, yeah. I think that, um, that he, it was a lot of responsibility really young. Yeah. And I think, think that's how he coped. And I think that the impact that my, his immediate family, the pressure he had from his immediate family to always be on, it was like that song tears of a clown. Yeah. That's always a song that reminds me of my dad by Smokey Robinson. And I think Vince could probably relate to like what a lot of people saw was him happy big personality yeah. spirit Fun what guy. we saw was him party. in the garage crying to us and making us listen to these horrible sad stories of his of how he grew up you know and yeah. we had to kind of we i think really I'm, i think more probably you than even me had to really listen to the negatives of you know why his alcoholism got so bad you know so do either of you know like when it started for him 
I, I don't. Like I said, I'll, I'll say it's always been like that. Yeah, as long as you've known and mm-hmm. recognized. There was always a party, always had alcohol, always had a beer in his hand. Um, weed was a normal thing, you know. And then later came the harder stuff. I then, I knew then that there was, oh, okay, that's different, you know, because I rec- I, the other stuff was normal. That's what he did, yeah. beer, weed. But then when the other stuff came around, I was like, oh, that's different. Something switched. Yeah. So what, if you guys are comfortable talking about it, yeah. like what, I know that it was alcoholism uh, essentially is what. Mm. Why he died. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's how he right. passed. Right. Yeah. Um, but he was addicted to other. Well, he, he messed around with meth. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I remember seeing him on that. The first time I remember seeing him on that was at a family reunion. And it was, uh, there was tons of people there. I mean, cause we have like literally take a panoramic picture for our family. I reunion. said that in our last yeah. episode. Literally. I'm like, it's so big. Yeah. And, uh, he goes in the girl's bathroom. And my cousin was in there and he, and he goes and I'm like, what are you doing? He goes like that. Cause he was drunk. Cause what the, un- all the older guys would get together and they sit around a table and pass a bottle of tequila around and finish it. So he was black. He was drunk. So he goes in the bathroom, stumbles in there and he goes, you know, and I was like, what the hell? And like, I don't know, five minutes later he comes out and he's like, Shh. and I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? He goes, I was getting some personality. That's what he says. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And he was whacked out and he just took off and I was like, and I knew, I was like, oh, dude, that's not good, you know? When I never really, I never realized the harder shit until like almost like same, like another g- getting older and, and seeing people grinding their jaw. I'll never forget. I could hear that sound his teeth would make when he'd be on drugs and just the grinding of his jaw was so intense. Yeah. And I remember being like, what the hell? When he's sleeping too, when he's like almost on sleep, yeah. he would do that. He grinds his teeth a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's definitely a lot of like memories now i think as being an adult and i'm like damn that shit was i mean severe enough that like just for people to really like he was 43 years old when he died yeah. he wasn't 55 he wasn't 60 Dad, you're how old I'm 40, 44 wow. i'm gonna be 40 yeah that's that's intense right there just thinking that you've already like outlived your father yeah well thinking about you at the same time because it yeah. could have taken any of our roads could have taken us anybody down that same path anybody i think that's too um you know it's been this year's 20 years that he's been gone and and he passed suddenly you know he was um he had had surgery on his heel because he was drunk and playing with my cousins um and jumped out of a tree yeah hit a root yeah hit a root and broke his shattered his ankle the ball, yeah so he had to have surgery and i'm such at, a cry baby too oh gosh the worst <laughs> And at the time, I actually worked in surgery here at Memorial, and I never would ever leave for my lunch, ever. I would always stay there because the cafeteria there is bomb. That's like the only thing about Memorial <laughs> I like. It's still bomb. Um, and so I was leaving for lunch, and I had like that old school Nokia phone. And I had a million messages. A lot of it was my grandma saying, you need to go to the hospital. And I was like, he probably got an infection in his mm. heel. because sur- My brother didn't even live here. He was yeah, in was Huntington saying, Beach. Yeah. So I was like, probably not a big deal. But I went and told you know the head nurse, like, I have to go. I guess my dad's in the hospital. And... I walked in to St. Joe's and he was in a, you know, in a uh, gown in a regular room and almost immediately the doctor and my stepmom pulled me outside and they were like, we need you to make this decision. She basically was like leaving it up to me to make this decision to put him on dialysis. At 19. You know, and I'm a 19 year old. I don't, I don't know anything about anything, literally. And I'm like, they're like, when we put the shun in, it could kill him on impact, which is something I think is they generally say for dialysis. Mm-hmm. And I remember being like, what the fuck? I'm supposed to like make this decision. I don't know anything. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. yeah, do it. And she was talking to the doctor outside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It, it, It got, it gets even more intense because typically when somebody's liver is failing, it's not pumping, you know, filtering out, out the blood. Yeah, and yeah. so all those toxins are going to your brain. So when mm-hmm. I went in the room and sat on the bed, he's talking literal gibberish, blah 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 blah, 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 blah like doing all this, and I'm sitting there like, what is happening? Like, yeah. what is going on? And then he, I think I just was looking down, and he, it was like he snapped out of, it and he said, "Me, how? What's wrong with you?" Like, or he said, "Why are you sad?" And I looked up at him, and I was like, "Well, I'm sad because what's going on with you?" You know, I was expecting one thing, and then went back or went there and it was like, this is not what's going on. It was this, this intense, like, you know, this is serious within, I think the same day he was in ICU, they flew you in. Well, mom called me. Yeah. And, I was, and she was hysterical. You know, yeah. Your dad's going to die. He's going to die. He's going to die. And I'm like, what? 
What are you talking about? You yeah. Know? He's not gonna, he's, they said he's going to die. I don't, I don't, you need to come home right now, right now, right now. And I was, I was like, hold on. And I know how people can get not, well, she was in the medical field. So I like gave her a little bit of leniency, but it was like people that don't know, they freak out. And they, so I was like, okay, let me get to the bottom of this. I called the hospital, talked to the nurse and she said, uh, she's like, yeah, no, he'll be, he'll be okay. Like you have, you have a little bit of time, you know? Yeah. Um, he, he probably has like a, a week. Or something like that. And I was wow. like, what? But even to hear that, like, yeah. and you think he's just going in there because of his heel. Mm-hmm. Well, in background, too, Vince is like the person in our family that, like, he's he's really gifted when it comes to medical stuff. He's able to explain what, you know, sometimes you go on doctor sale of shit and you're like, what are you, like, I, and yeah. he's always able to explain. And I, I, what I really remember from that period is I never thought he was going to die. No one ever broke that down to me. And I specifically remember this memory where, you came home you came and then so i think tony he, picked me up yeah April. i think he was getting better and you went home yeah and then i, I think yeah. i think my stepsister flew him on a, in on a red eye and and all that time i still never thought he was gonna die i think i left the hospital it was eight days i think i left once to shower like the second day and then stayed there they like gave me you know not a room but like saint joe's was really really accommodating we have so much family they actually gave us i think the day before he died like a conference room because there was like 50 people wow. there praying and waiting and it was this big impact but I'll never forget he had the same, pretty much the same nurse most of the time. And then I remember the shift changed and this male nurse, it was you and I in there with him only. And the male nurse was like, well, yeah, something about him dying. And I was like, and I remember the look on, on I'll never forget this because like you protected me. I remember you pulled the nurse out. I was like, no one thought, like no one's talked to my sister about this yet. You know, like basically my brother like shuffled him out so that like i i think would he could protect me to not ever like think that's what was going to happen because i never ever thought that was going to happen i never i wasn't staying there i wasn't thinking that i was like he's going to be out of this and you're he's, 19 that's I'm not 19. even where i'm your so head's naive at. and dumb about everything that like i just thought i think i was in future mode where i was like how is this going to impact my family and I's daily living. Like my brother's probably gonna have to move home. He's not going to be him, his same self. He's going to be like a shell of himself. And we're going to have to just do what we can to like give him the best quality of life. I never, the whole time he was in the hospital thought he was going to die until he literally flatlined when we were in the room. Wow. Yeah. You know, I never, I didn't think it was going to be to that extent. And then you start going through the, like, what was our last conversation? What was the last thing I said to him before this all happened? And, I remember two times, two incidents before he died, he pulled up to my mom's house late night. And I mean, at this point, this is, you know, 15 to 16 years after my parents separated. And I've been gone for two years. Yeah. My dad never came in our house. When he came to pick us up for his weekend, he honked. We went out. Mm -hmm. He would joke around with my little siblings, you know, for my stepdad. Maybe say hi to my mom. Nicknames for them. Nicknames for all of them. He would call Kimo, Kimo, Kimo. Oh, they all loved him. Oh, they were at the funeral crying their eyes out because like they didn't, you know, they just knew him as like our dad and he would joke around and be his self with them too. So kids loved him. He's hilarious. So it never, um, it never dawned on me that anything was that severe. He never came in our house. He would honk. We'd go out. And then I remember him pulling up and his hand was split open and he was, I I don't even know how he made it to my mom's house. Honestly, I don't know how he he was so falling over drunk and he had said he got into like a fight with somebody at a bar in the Hills and somebody pulled a knife and he, yeah, it's always, it's, it was this extreme, but I mean, to be honest, I'm like, I don't know if they're true or not. You never knew if they were true or not because it was so intense, but like his hand was split open. My mom had him come in. He slept on the couch and he was gone before we even woke up the next morning. And you know, she stitched, you know, did what she can to like help him. And then my last memory is him pulling up to my mom's house and honking and no shit. His eyes were like mustard yellow. Wow. He was so jaundice. I, I, and I mean, as he is yellow as that couch. And I remember telling my mom and just seeing the look on my mom's face, like, I think she knew then, you know, and never talked to me about it, never said, but I think it just was this culturally accepted Mm -hmm. and our family accepted that he had a problem, Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? And, and two years before he died, um, he went to the doctor and the doctor told him that if he doesn't stop drinking, you're going to die. I was going to ask yeah. if he, if this was just like, he just didn't go to the doctor, no, he, but he, he did. He and knew, they... he knew and he kept going. And oh, I definitely think he knew when he was laying in the ICU because when Vince and I would walk in, he would have tears rolling down yeah. his face as each he, like, organ this is, failed. This is it. Yeah. Each organ, it's like a chain reaction until, yeah. until finally your heart is the last muscle that, sorry. 
it's okay. Don't apologize. Yeah. That doesn't want to, it doesn't want to stop. Yeah. And I think that's the thing is like, I remember us walking in and, and just, he would have tears, you know, streaming down his face. Cause I'm like, I can only imagine him laying there, th- you know, seeing my brother and I, and just thinking like, how the, how, why the fuck did I let this happen? You know, it's just your life. You're laying here, uh, you know, watching, you like feeling your body shut down and thinking like, you know, it's when it really, bo- it bothers me every day still it's still something that sits with me not bothers that's a bad word but it's like i miss him every day and i i think about you know all the things i've accomplished and like would he be proud of me and i think the last couple years what's been the hardest is jacqueline Mm -hmm. you know vince having this beautiful amazing hilarious daughter who just emulates so much of his personality she's just so fun and light and funny and you know, when you get to know her, she just, she's just funny. And I think about like how much fun him and my grandma swing will like how much fun, Yeah, they love it. you know? Well, and I'll mm. tell you, this always impacts me with how, how impactful my dad was. I have seen my grandma swingle in my life cry two times. Once was when she came over and told me she came over and tried to wanted to tell me in person that my aunt Carla had cancer. And I started immediately sobbing and my grandma was like, she left. She didn't say anything. She just went out the door and went across the street because my mom lived across the street. And then when my dad died, when I saw her the first time after my dad died, she said, she literally looked at me and I was just crying to her. And she said, damn it, Tito. And she started crying. I mean, my grandma did not get upset. And that was just the impact he had, you know, after yeah, no matter how much damage he did, which was a lot, they still loved him. Even my, even my mom, my mom oh. was abused by my dad physically you know, and this is something that for people to hear this is going to be hard, but like there was a lot of people that denied it and did not give my mom what she deserved. My mom was a, an amazing wife to my dad. She gave my dad us and deserves all the accolades. And my mom is the type of person that even when my dad would pull up to the house, she made it a point to like be okay, you know? And it's like in the the, the moments where she'll talk about my dad now, well, her, I'll ask her questions about stuff about his childhood that I I never got to have those conversations with him. I never even got to say, I'm mad at you for abandoning us for yeah. some time, you know, when he left our family. I never got to have those conversations with him, which probably would have given Vince and I both a lot of closure, maybe my mom some closure, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. my mom still, you know, she'll well, she'll talk good about my dad. There's three things I remember very distinctly about his, the whole process of him from when he went in the hospital till when he died. Um, the first one was, the last words he said to me was he said come here and i said what and i came up to him and this is before he was intubated and i said what's up dad and he was yellow you know and he goes me go get me a king cobra 40. and i said no you're you're in here. you're gonna die right now yeah. because of this this is what you was and you want me to go get your 40. and he and he just turned his head at me and he wouldn't he didn't say anything else yeah wow and then my mom went in there when he was dead and she, uh, she laid over him. Sorry. And she, she wailed. She, I always love you. She always be my, my first love. It was so sad. And she, and she hugged him and she, I've never seen her cry like that before. It was really bad. And then the other, uh, the other thing was, um, when I left and I was crying, my one of my family members came up to me, which I do not like this dude. And he said, "Hey, you gotta, you gotta be strong. You gotta suck it up. Don't show weakness for your family." And I'm like, "Who the fuck are you, dude?" Yeah, yeah. It's, that's a cultural thing, too, yeah, unfortunately, it is. where people, you know, like he was taught that that's how mm-hmm. you need to be is man up. Yep. Yeah. And I said, get, "Get the fuck away from me!" And I went around the corner and I cried. Yeah. But those are the three things I remember. That's what affected me. And that was. But seeing my mom like that was pretty bad. Yeah. So what, like, if you're comfortable talking about it, like, your relationship with your dad, how has that impacted or influenced how you parent now having beautiful little Jacqueline? <laughs> um, uh, I don't want to... It's it's strange because, first of all, you see this man go through all these things and do all these terrible things to you and your family. Um, there's a lot of good moments too, but I mean, and you don't, you don't want to be that person, but it's like, I guess they see a lot of credit cause she's done it really good for herself. 
She didn't go down the path I went down, but I was very destructive to myself. And uh, I don't want to do that. To, I don't want to be that person for Jacqueline. I want to give her a good life. You are giving her a good life. I was going to say know, the same thing. You, that's exactly what you're doing right now, too. That's but, but coping, like the coping thing is for me, She, I coped by, by using drugs and by drinking and partying and, and not dealing with my feelings. And it's, you know, it's had a very, very huge impact on my life it, mentally and it just uh, overall just like prospering. And if and if he was been a different person, I feel like I'd have, I could I could have done a lot of great things. But, that, but that, uh, it's like a black cloud hold over your head. It's hard for you to get rid of. Yeah, I think that it's. Um, I think Vince and I both we had very different relationships with my dad. I think that everybody who knows me or even people maybe that are following this can tell I have a, a natural confidence. And I think some of that was I was born that way. And I think a lot of that is my dad, I, I walked on water with him. He always told me these amazing things. Uh, you're amazing. You're smart. You're beautiful. You're brave. I didn't hear negative stuff where Vince got a lot of the cultural yeah, machismo. My dad was hard on him physically. He was hard on him mentally, emotionally. And that's what I say. I think that, you know, people who may listen to this and, and know one version of him don't get that his kids and I'm sure my stepmom as well had to see this other. It's like when the mask was off, when the clown suit was hung up, he was this emotionally sad, depressed, you know, coping through a severe addiction. Mm -hmm. That's what we also had to see. I you was, know, never, I was sad for him. Like even now, yeah, I was, I was sad for him, you know, um, Yes, I was a victim of certain things, but I mean, I was I was sad for him because he was super. As time went on, he was just you know he wasn't drinking because at first, and just like any drug addict or alcoholic, it's it's getting your feet wet, you know. Yeah. It's, it's having fun, you know. Um, but that addiction part, if it's in your blood, if it's accepted and culturally, then you're just gonna, you're gonna keep doing it. Nobody's gonna stop you and tell you, hey, maybe you should like hey kick back, you know. I care about you. Yeah, um, yeah like I'm noticing you're drinking a little yeah. more than normal. No, that didn't happen. So they, they no, he didn't have that. Um, later down the road, he was a wandering soul. He would just, he never was home. He would drive around, always drinking, try to find places to go to. The people who would normally open their doors for him, now they've cleaned up their act. They're not doing what he used to do. So he got doors shut in his face. He's living you know, this life by himself. By himself. Now. That's very lonely. Yeah, that's and, a literal perfect way to say. It. And I don't know and if you feel this way, but I, I have a. Everybody, I mean, my grandma would make fun of me for it. I do not like when people show up at my house unannounced. No, and he would, but yeah, no. But if he you would. Sh if you show up, if you're like, hey, I'm in Midtown, mm -hmm. you know, are you? Can I stop by? Are you yeah. available? And and I'll be honest, like, no, or yeah, sure. Thank you for letting me know, not just knocking on my door. Mm -hmm. Better never say no to me. Because <laughs> we would always cruise around with them. And, oh, well, how many kids, nights will we go to every, like your Nino's every, house yeah. to show up? People would just let us in. Like, well, you could see chill. on people's faces that they're like, like I remember being a little kid and seeing people Not be first, like, though. I think that really like, oh, Tito's are cool, you know? Like, yeah, it's gonna be fun. And, and then, then I, was... but we're all from the time you know I was a kid to the time when I was a teenager. I remember seeing the gradual process of this, you know, person getting denied later, and me just sitting in the car like, hold on, let me go up to the the door. And you weren't with us a couple times. Mm -hmm. And then I went up, he went up there and the dude was like, his friend was standing outside the house and he was like, no, you know, and then he came back in the car and then we took off and I was like, I saw that. It went from like, Hey, come in, you know, to, uh, yeah, come in. Oh, dang, Tito's here. You know, you could see in people's faces and he didn't want to see that though. And then it went to the point where they're just turning him away. Yeah. Now, now he's going long distances to people's houses, like out like way out in the country. Yeah. People that probably didn't talk to in a long time that he knew that drank. Yeah. I mean, so those were his enablers. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I always say, like, I feel like you and I, you and I know Amador and Calaveras County, like the back of our oh, hands. Oh, yeah. Because that's what we do. Like Sundays, like, we, yeah. you know, my dad, once when he left, he moved to Stockton. That's why Vince and I partially kind of grew up in Stockton. We know Stockton so well. But also on Sundays, if we weren't going to a campo, you know, we would we were like fucking celebrities in a campo because yeah. <laughs> we would literally pull up in my dad in my either my stepmom's Buick or my dad's El Camino. Mm -hmm. He'd give us each five bucks, which 
I mean, this is the nineties. Like that's like a hundred dollars worth of candy candy. now. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. So we would like pull up and my cousins would be surrounding the car. Like, yes. Like, (laughs) and Vince would kick it with like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He would have his, like his age group of cousins and I'd have my age group of cousins and sprinkling nerds. Yeah. Yeah, Literally making it rain. (laughs) Fucking candies. Cinnamon toothpicks. The the old uh, gum cigarettes. I thought it was so tight. And we would just be, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we would just be like, we would run a campo when we were like pulled up that, those couple, you know, a couple times a month because that's how it was. And yeah, everybody, everybody knew him. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people, I think good example is, you know, last summer we unfortunately had a cousin that was murdered and, you know, we got invited to be, um, at a cousin's house to like, you know, honor him and, you know, you know, everybody was drinking and we were all having fun and, I started kind of asking because I distanced myself from my family, you know, after my dad passed away, I think I was in, you both did. Yeah. I think I was really bitter and, you know, never with a lot of them felt a strong connections. My cousins always his side, his side hit my cousins. Mm -hmm. There was, I I think there's 26 of us. I could be off a little bit, but I always was super close to all my cousins, especially like my age group of cousins. There's like four or five of us are within like six months of each other. And, um, a lot of you know older family I, I didn't feel in my immediate family I didn't feel super close to and you know as time got went on and I've gotten older it's just been what it is but you know sitting at this party I started asking questions like you know did what basically what impact did my dad have and it was like no one had anything but like your dad would like when he'd come pick you guys up he'd always come pick one of us up we spent a lot of the weekends and the summers camping mm. i mean it would be like he would get like a pack of bologna and loaf yeah. of bread and like a six pack of coke and we go to mm. columbia state park for the day and it was like the, the time of our yeah, lives yeah, he'd it's always nice let me buy like, little rocks and crystals and like he didn't have a lot of money nope. but he he didn't need to, you know, he didn't, he had, his personality was so big. Like he would take his jackrabbit hunting and like make a sharp and like, who the fuck's catching a jackrabbit? Nobody's catching a jackrabbit, right? Like <laughs> he kept but, you busy. Like, I did. Yeah. At least did I you? think I did once. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I did. Yeah. It's a squirrel. <laughs> yeah. You know, we would walk like from a campo to the trussle and Lodi and he would make like, he sure. made Vince and I fearless where he'd be like, my boy cousins were going to do it. He'd be like, Stacy, you'll go show him how to do it. Like Vince and show him how to, you know, he, he just, he was brave and, and big and big personality. And I don't know for you, but like hearing those stories was like, man, this like 20 years later, my cousins are still talking about like your dad yeah. was more of a dad figure to me than my own dad was. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's in the so puddles. special that yeah. he created like these experiences and memories with mm-hmm. like your cousins too. And yeah. he, he was only 43. So to man, know that's that mm-hmm. that's how old he was and you all were that small and they still, to your point, 20 years later yeah, are having such strong feelings and memories of him. That's special. Yeah. yeah people loved him. People did. And I think it's, it's hard. I mean, I know for me, I was a he little, he's a lot of favorite cousin. He's a lot of the, of the favorite cousin to a lot of people to a lot of people. Yeah. And I think, I don't know about you, but I was, I feel like I'm an open book about everything and I, I have, I don't, care you know i've said it a thousand times i don't give a fuck what people think about me but there is an anxiety around talking about this negative part of him the physical abuse with my mom the physical abuse with my brother the you know way he you know talked to vince and the you know he he had multiple affairs on my mom and he would take me when i was a kid i remember you know and people think don't think kids can like catch on to stuff but Mm -hmm. he we went to uh woodbridge middle school or at the time it was uh, um this is a middle school. Um, and we pulled up and he goes, me, go play over there. Go play in the playground. And I was like, okay. You listen to your dad. Yeah. So I go play in the playground and he was in the distance with the woman, like, you know, ass grabbing, just messing around and stuff. And I just, I knew that wasn't right. I knew I was like, he had that feeling in his stomach. I was like, that's not right. He's doing something bad, you know? Yeah. But, you know, he was doing his thing and I was supposed to play. So I think that his life was just led by his addiction and his i i mean i think the word i think about when i think about my dad's addiction is period is escape i think he was running from and escaping life life and the thoughts that he had and 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 honestly maybe the response i can never i can't even imagine have a child at 39 i can't imagine what it's like to be an 18 year old and it's like now you're a man now you get this serious shot now you buy a house now you step up and you have this tiny thing you're taking care of Mm -hmm. and then your wife gets pregnant again five years later and it's like who even knows if him and my mom would have ended up together if they wouldn't have had vince 
So it's like people don't talk about that. Yeah. It's, it's still that age old. You made this choice. You stay with this person forever. But then it's like, he's out cheating and doing all these negative things and being physically abusive with my mom when she's confronting him about it. It's like, mm, like who knows how much happier he would have been had he just lived his life the way he wanted to versus what everyone told him he was supposed to do. And and that probably started even way before him and your mom even got together. Like addiction and mental illness, like Mm -hmm. go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So he obviously had stuff going on at a far deeper level than Mm -hmm. even having a kid, you know, that just all exasperated. I'm sure everything. Yeah. Yeah. He never, he probably never dealt with his emotions that, you know, same kind of deal like what I'm going through with, with maybe his dad, my grandpa, who to me he's a great person. I mean, I I love him, and um, you know, but he might not have been a good person to my dad. And I guess he would make, they'd make him fight all the time. Like yeah, the machismo thing was was straight up culturally. That's a big deal. It, it runs was, deep. It runs deep, and he, he, my grandpa would do it to my dad. Um, he'd make him box all and stuff. I mean, maybe he didn't want to do that. Maybe he wasn't a fighter. Yeah, you know, yeah. And so, well, and had, this is all alleged stuff that my dad told us that we don't. Well, I know me. Some or I forgot who told me that that they would do that, but that uh, you know my grandpa would treat my dad a certain way. You know he was yeah abusive to him as well. Yeah, well, which is so funny too because like like Vince said, like that's not the impression we got of no our dad. Even my great grandpa, my mom's side. There's I've heard people say you know some little negative things where I'm like yeah right you know and and I would say that about grandpa on dad's side. Like I see in my grandpa where my dad gets his humor. He's yeah. even though grandpa speaks very broken English, like he always found a way to be funny and like make things where you're like, he's funny. Still like connect with you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like he's humorous. And, and I saw where my dad got that like personality from, you know what I mean? So yeah, you know, there's, there's, I think that Vince and I could sit here and both say things about both of our parents, you know, and, and I'm sure you, you guys could say things uh, about everyone, your, you yeah. know, that like it is, um, it is scary and, crazy to think to be a parent and just you know no matter how perfect of a parent you are your kid is going to be fucked up in some way or another it's just the state of the world you will never do everything right no and and you'll look back i I know that just having conversations with my parents now as an adult like they're constantly looking back and i tell my mom all the time you can't feel guilty because i'm having an open dialogue about my experiences as a kid Mm. because i don't blame you i don't blame you because you were dealing with whatever traumas and stuff that you had from your childhood Mm -hmm. and you did the best that you could. So uh, you can't feel guilty. I don't have those conversations with my parents to make them feel guilty about anything. It's done. What's done is done. And we just need to, you know, acknowledge certain things for our own personal Mm -hmm. healings, I think. But it's, I mean, they did the best that they could. And I think for your, your dad, they're, we we can't sit here and excuse his bad behavior no. but at the same time he had his own demons oh, and yeah. that's that's what addiction is yeah and t- for his last words to be essentially to you mm-hmm. like go get me a 40 yeah. like he, that's not what he wants his last words to no. be but the demon ha- got him yeah you know when well, i think alcoholism and i think addiction period runs in every family in one form or another you know, I, I, I know people don't drink, but you know, spend $500 at Target every weekend. Yeah. You know, or I think Amazon, there's food, or, you know what like I mean? Eating, or, yeah. There's all kinds of different addictions. Yeah, sex yeah. addictions. There's so many different types of addictions, you know, gambling. And I think in our family, it definitely has been, you know, for the most part, mm-hmm. alcohol. And yeah, like I always appreciate my brother saying good things about me, but I, I've, I've had my moments too. You know, I've, I think the only difference between you and I is I have never, I'm, I've always been too scared to try hard drugs because I, no, it could probably go to a dark place. And I've been in, in a sober enough mind. And I've never, to be honest, I think the smartest decision I've made is not to surround myself with people that did. That's the thing right there. That's because it. you, you, we, you and I had a different crowd, right? Vince was always the popular guy at both high schools. Everybody, he's like my dad. Everybody knows him. Everybody loves him. I, oh, I have always said about you, like, if I'm going to bring somebody with me somewhere, it's going to be my brother. Cause it's going to be a good ass time. Everybody loves him. They know him. He's fun. He's handsome. Like he's all these okay. great and wonderful things. And some of that is from my dad. <laughs> exactly. No, that's how I feel about you. You don't have to agree about Cypher. Cool. And can I that. just say one thing? Like, I don't think you give yourself enough credit for all of the work that you've put in. And so just you're an amazing human. And Thank just you for you much. 
doing wanting to do better and different for your own daughter there's gonna be highs and lows that's just yeah inevitable. that's life ebbs and flows yeah so it's just special that like you know what you want to be and don't want to be and you wake up every single day trying your very best and you see yeah. that in the way Jacqueline is with him you see that she you're Thank her you. you're her fucking yes. b- b- the planet of her like you're the everything of her world more than even my mom who my mom to those grandkids are everything you're everything to Jacqueline and I think the one thing I, I was thinking about this like knowing we're going to record this episode is I think that in some ways dad gave you a gift because you are smart enough to know that some of the things that he did are wrong even though you've gone down your own path you knew they were wrong and you the second you you know Jordan got pregnant you were like I'm changing my life. Well, yeah. both of you, you know, you deserve accolades for that. Yeah. Cause some people stay in that life. It's it, addiction is a disease and people don't get no, that. I know. I know. And it's, and it's hard. It's rough. And it, t- it I'll tell you, I don't know if you feel this way, but I, I was, I definitely have gone through those phases of grief. Yeah. Um, you know, I've openly talked about my own depression when I was, you know, in a, in a long relationship before and all of a sudden waking up crying and, every day not being able to get a bed and luckily that person worked an opposite schedule so it's like they weren't really knowing what's going on and until i saw professional help it's like no you're finally grieving because i did a lot of what i did in another city Mm -hmm. there was a lot of days i was waking up going to work and still drunk from the night before living the college life but to the extreme i mean i remember those friends from lodi who lived there looking at me and talking to me and being like you know it's those fa- uh, those faces that it's like you're taking this too far yeah everybody's having a good time and you've officially taken it to the next level you know what i mean yeah, so I exactly not in that it. fun yeah. party way it's like, not yeah. fun anymore it's, it's functioning at that point and, and i did that a lot of my life yeah for like 20 like almost 30 years yeah of like extreme yeah you know, going at it and uh i hate that feeling I yeah but feeling look at like you now going being hung over or making yourself throw up on the phone because you're calling in sick and you want to convince them that you're sick. So yeah. you're throwing, so you like gag yourself. It's yeah. Like, and you, and you think that everything's okay, like, Oh, I got, I'm going to call in sick. It's fine. Or something like that from work. And you just look like an idiot and it's embarrassing. Well, when you're living in that too, I think that you really think you're getting away with something. Oh, you think you're sly. Right. You think you're you're so like, sly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nobody knows. Yeah, nobody, nobody knows <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. yeah. And do you, do you, sorry. Were you no, gonna, no, go ahead. Uh, do you guys feel like to go back to your dad for a sec too? Do you guys feel like you would like ever have to like cover up for him or 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 like clean up after him? Yeah, no, because everybody knew who he was. Everybody knew, so it was just accepted. That's what I'm saying. Like, and people that didn't, maybe I don't, even, I don't even know. Maybe somebody did talk to him and say, "Hey, Tito, you need to." Obviously, the doctor did. You yeah, know, but um, family, friends, yeah, just n- kind of accepted. Yeah, we don't really know that information. But he never, honestly, nobody, yeah, we don't. And I don't know. Maybe you have to strap him up and put him in a, in a rehab just like hey this is where you're gonna be i don't care if, if against his own will because i don't think he would have i don't he, he didn't want to he he did not want to change he didn't want to deal with the reality honestly he was a sad person because he didn't want to deal with the realities of life you know from maybe his like we were telling his past i'm not sure um i think he, i think he his lived big choice in his was, mistakes well that's I, what i'm saying yes yeah. because his the so when and that's came out very true like later in life when so two weeks before he died before he went into the hospital he called me every day and tried to make conversation with me and I was so bitter because of how he was growing up that I was like what what you know sure we're very short with him and then at the end at the, at the end of every conversation he always said me I'm sorry I'm sorry for what I did to you I'm so sorry I love you. And I was like, yeah, well, whatever, whatever is too late now. So I got to go, you know, and I'd hang up the phone. He did that for two weeks. And then, and then the, on a the Friday, I was like, I don't know. He's like, me, my, my, uh, my legs are swollen and they hurt. And I'm, like, I don't, I'm not a doctor, dude. Go to the doctor. I'm, what do you want me to do? And I'll help the phone. And then I think it's like the Monday that I get the call from my mom. He was in the hospital. He was, he was in the hospital. He knew. I think he always knew because I think when I say that, like, I regret not that was something I was hung up on for a long time. You know, we've had 20 years 
to go through all this and 20 years to remember i mean i've gone through bitterness where i'm like fuck everybody who ever drank with him fuck everybody like you you helped take my dad from me if i you know like when i was engaged like my dad's not gonna be able to walk me down the aisle because fuck you you're not you know you're not coming to my wedding i went through the sadness where i felt sorry for myself you know and i think i had a little bit of that when when my niece was born where it was like you know and you're never gonna be here and it's just anger oh i mean the anger's been the biggest for me me too the anger's been the biggest for me towards people who i feel like enabled him and the anger i've had towards him you know i've had to really i think because my dad treated me so good I've had to really remember, like, these were his choices. Yeah. It wasn't anybody. Carry that weight. No, I carried that weight for a long time. And then, you know, just. But that's the difference between you and I, I think, because he gave you, he was good to you, like, and yeah. he treated me like dirt. So I have insecurities. Yeah. You know, I have, I doubt myself all the time. Yeah. I hate that about myself. Yeah. And, and no, and that's true. And I think that, like, I even think for a long time it was, it caused, resentment between Vince and I and I think it caused resentment between my mom and I you know my mom would call him Disneyland dad a lot when I was young and I and I used to get so pissed but it's like in reality that a lot of that was true my mom I think for all five of my all five of us is the stability in our life your mom like she's yeah. something else she's strong. she is and she's, she's always like amazing she like, is amazing to a lot you know, and the, it goes beyond just her five children, like mm-hmm. too. You know, like what she does for her own community and her yeah. extended mm-hmm. family is like. Yeah. And, just, her and students I hardly even know her, and it's like, yeah. Wow. I, every day I'm like, what the heck? Every time we talk about yeah. her, she has students that still they graduated. They're like 30 now, and they still yeah. contact her and talk to her on a regular. Yeah, literally. Like that's the impact she just has yeah. on people. She does have that, and I and, she and has honestly, the same thing I have though. She's she she's been through a lot of that stuff, and she even though she is as strong as she is she still has a lot of the insecurities and the well, same things I do. Demons. The yeah. demons that I do. Yeah. I think that when you're with people, you know, in your childhood, like I, th- I feel like my mom and my brother are, are similar. Mm-hmm. You know, my mom besties. Yeah. <laughs> so seriously, my mom and my brother went through similar things where it's like when you have somebody telling you, you ain't shit your whole life, you start, you believe that you ain't shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like the opposite effect where my dad always told me I was everything he told Vince he wasn't shit and I think he did that to my mom and she believed it and then the it's you know the the cheating and all that and the physical abuse it breaks you down every time it gets too more late at a and more point too. And, you know it's like you're carrying these buckets and somebody keeps putting a drop of water mm-hmm. in it after so many years you know your arms are gonna break because you can't do it anymore yeah and so I think there's been resentment on both sides where, you know, I, I didn't ever feel like growing up. We were close. Yeah. I remember always feeling as a kid, like he hated me and he probably did being a kid, not, not, not even realizing how he felt about me. It was just resentment. There was a huge for- disconnect between us, a huge disconnect yeah. between us. I was always close to my younger we were siblings. We always together. Always. I mean, we grew up in the same household, you know, yeah. for most of our lives. And yeah. then it was like, you like know, you I never. You got to take your sister to the store with you when you go to the store. Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe all brothers do that. I'm not sure, but I think I'm that's sure. an old brother thing. I think that's an old brother thing. It's <laughs> like yeah. a sibling thing. Yeah. In general. yeah don't put that yeah. shit on me. That's <laughs> an old brother thing. <laughs> now you're like, Stacy, let's go to the yeah. store. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, no, in this last, what, since Jacqueline's been born, it's like, I've said it multiple times and you're like, he's my best friend and we, you know, and that's a lot of that's my fault. Cause I was in my addiction and you know, I, oh, I don't I, think it's I, your I fault. I didn't like life at all. I didn't care about myself. I was just going through the motions. Are you comfortable talking about, because this might be a piece of something that could help somebody else, like what like coping mechanisms you've used in your own life? Drugs and alcohol. No, well, like Uh, through your recovery. Like what, um, outside of that, now that you're in recovery. To be honest, you know, I I feel like I was raised right in certain certain aspects of my life, but, um, you know, I was... For Jacqueline, I was doing the right thing for her. Like that's, that's what I was hanging on to for a long time. So I don't think I really ever. I went to counseling. Developed really good coping skills, and so just recently, well, that recent like last six months, maybe three and four months. I don't know. That's six months probably. Um, I've mentally like had problems because uh, it kind of all just hit me at once. Like what was really going on in my life. So. 
I was I'm str- I was struggling and still sort of am, but you know, um, coping just in general. And uh, but I'm still, of course, going to be a great father to Jacqueline. But uh, no, I got a lot of work to do still. Yeah. We all do. We we all do. But I think that but you know what I'm you saying? recognizing like, that too, where like Jacqueline can't always be the moral compass because exactly. eventually I could be okay with myself. Yeah, eventually that will wear off, mm-hmm. or she's gonna get older, or it's just gonna not yeah. be the thing that's going to be able to keep you together. What I will say, he has a lot of pressure too, because I think there are parents who have kids and that's their entire life. They live, breathe, die, put their identity in being a parent. And, and I'm not knocking those people, but I don't think that's always healthy because then it creates this like perception that you have to be perfect and your kids need to see parents being human beings upset and how they navigate that and how they navigate that that's more important than every anything is when my brother is going through hard times or i'm going through hard times i'm not going to lie to her or my other nieces and nephews and say auntie's perfect auntie feels happy every day auntie does not feel happy every day oh they know you know what i mean yeah like i tell i i try to be honest and say like I don't feel good today or I'm, you know, I saw, I don't know why, but I woke up sad today. Yeah. And, and I will say like for my brother, Vince and I specifically more than the three younger ones, we've lived more lives than most people have. We've seen from both parents shit that I don't think kids should ever have seen. And the fact that him and I are, I mean, I know like, as you guys know, I am making my 40th the biggest deal of all time. And I have openly said, I never thought I'd make it to 30. There were, yeah. there were times in high school where I wanted to kill myself. Like I never, I never felt accepted or okay. Yeah. And I think that what do you do when you're raised with a family who, you know, deal copes through addiction? It's like, I started drinking when I was a senior and that was like a fucking spiral from there, you know? And, um, I yeah. think that like the fact that him and I are even still standing today is a miracle. I mean, honestly, I've had for, somebody actually tell me that when yeah. I was in high school yeah, or no, a little out of high school. Because somebody that that I didn't, I really, I knew them, but I didn't. And they're like, oh my God, you're uh, Tito and Denise's son? And I'm like, yeah. They're like, oh my God, you're doing so good. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, we did not expect for you guys to, to do this good in, in life. And I was like, I didn't know to take this as a compliment or, you know, and I'm like, oh, well, all right, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's kind of like when you wear yeah. makeup to work and people are like, wow, you don't look <laughs> tired. It's like, okay, well, fuck. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> that was my it's the same and type and of shit. Said, and it's just like, you know, it's just only because, you know, we know you've been through so much. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, and I, I think for me personally, I I have really educated myself and been like, fuck you, I'm going to show you guys how, because I mean, even my dad, there was times when I got older, when I started being a little more like defiant towards him when I was like 15, 16 and not wanting to honor the every other weekend. Like, no, I want to hang out with my friends or I'm going to, I have a tournament this weekend. I want to do that. Oh yeah. And he started giving me pushback. Like he, I know, you know, a couple of times you make a comment, like if you don't stop, you're going to end up pregnant. Like your mom. Oh my God. Yeah. At 17. I remember being like, watch me lose my virginity last out of everybody. You know, like I really, I really think that that I take things that people say about me and I use that as a reason to be more successful. But then you have to stop and ask, like, am I addicted to success? You know, Kate always makes fun of me. Like, cool. You finished your master's. Now you're going to start your fucking admin credential. Like you're never going to be out of school. You know, it's like a joke in my household. She's like, you just want to be like the most educated person ever. And I'm like, yeah, but sometimes I feel like I feel like I put pressure on myself. I need to be the most successful person in my family. So if something is to happen to one of my siblings, I'm going to be the one that steps in and does this. I'm going to be the one that blah, blah, blah. I don't ever want to be in a position where I depend on any significant other of mine to, to lift me up or or my mom if I have to, That's which good. I know I can. My mom would die for me to ask her for help. You know what I mean? Um, and I have in the last five years. She's definitely helped me with my education financially. I and think she has enough on her plate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But like, um, you know, there's there's definitely been um, a, like a certain pressure for me, I think, to to do really well to pick up, you know, what I perceived as like the slack when in reality it's like, no, dude, you like you're not perfect either. And you need to be your per- your be your imperfect self. And it's and, and accept that that's OK. I love that you say that, too, because I feel like this that's the whole point of like one of the reasons we wanted to even do this podcast was to show the imperfections of being human. And I think that you, you hold a, you carry a lot of weight that's unnecessary and I can relate. I know we have many conversations about this. Um, but I, I think that 
you've done a lot of work on yourself too. I don't know if you are wanting to like talk about some things that you've done over the yeah. the past decade. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you that my work with Heather, you know, who we had the, an episode with Heather Vasquez, she, that's been the most impactful for me with my healing process as far as my dad. Um, because she's really helped me connect with him. She's really helped me, um, see myself for who I am because I think we all have this perception of ourselves. And I think with confidence, some can sometimes come arrogance. And I definitely think I've been guilty of that. I know, (laughs) I know when my brothers, you know, have gone through their addictions, I really was like, how could you let this happen? I very much had this like period of like, you're disgusting to me. I can't believe you mostly with Vince go down the same path as dad, seeing the impact it had on me, the impact on you. And I had to really educate myself on addiction as a disease because it is i had to really like get off my soapbox and understand that like this is not helpful you know and and to be honest with you the person who really takes those lashings is my mom i really you know especially when my brothers are in their addictions going i I can't even imagine i mean i can't imagine now because i have a daughter yeah but and i feel so bad about that you you shouldn't feel bad i know it's like it's painful painful to like see you know some you're kid that you love so much to go through something like that and it's like man i didn't be when you're when you're in the addiction you don't care about anything really nothing and you don't you don't care about that stuff who's impacting and it's it sucks that's terrible i feel terrible about it well there'd even be times when vince like i remember us getting this one fight where he said like the meanest shit to me and me leaving and being devastated and it was my sister and her ex-boyfriend at the time and being like I was more upset because I'm like, I don't even fucking know that person. Was that in front of mom's house? In No, it was in the garage. Uh, at mom's house? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like, I don't that was even, another time. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't even remember. I didn't even know. It was like staring at somebody that you're like, I remember thinking like, he's lost. He's gone, you know? And well, some people, when, pe- when people are so hurt, they just want other people to be yeah. hurting yeah. too. Like, he, he could have meant no- none of what no, he I don't, said. Yeah. He definitely didn't mean any of it. He's, yeah. The it's stuff just like, he was saying is not I even his you values. Right you know, it was very like you're derogatory. Right. You're most likely you're, whatever you're saying, you're correct about. And I had nothing to stand on. So that's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. You attack. And Heather's been really instrumental in helping me. I mean, specifically that situation, I got a session with her because it was so hurtful and impactful to me that he was saying those things that it was nice you know, Heather's openly talked about how she's in recovery and as somebody who is a recovering alcoholic, she was like, you know, not only like shine the light on like, this is what your brother's going through. And this is why as somebody who understands recovery, but is also somebody who is going to lead you to your higher self. Like, this is what you need to do. Like, let me take the spotlight off him and let's put it on you because what are you struggling with? That's so, who are you going out with? And like taking like the three extra shots you shouldn't have been taking and, and black, not remembering how you got home, you know? And I've, I, she, I remember she asked me one time straight up, like, are you in recovery? It was one of our first sessions. I was like, no. And she's like, oh, okay. Cause she must've saw it, you know? And, and I remember thinking like, I don't have an issue with alcohol, but it's like, and I, and I still don't think I have an issue with alcohol, but I definitely think I have an issue with like taking it too far sometimes. Yeah. You know, I like to be that person just like my dad was at the party and at the bar, like, like, yay, me. let's karaoke. <laughs> let's dance. Let's yep. get on the bar. Like, Oh, you want to buy me a drink? Sure. It's like, I should have said no to the last four drinks knowing that was like my limit, you know? And I didn't because I'm, I'm fun person. I'm fun girl. Like I'm doing the most. I'm going to have a great time. But it's like, yeah, but now you're like, waking up the next morning not doing your skincare routine which everybody knows is an issue for me <laughs> and also being like how the fuck did i or get with, home or with the abrasions yeah yeah or fighting people yeah. you know like it's it's stupid and and irresponsible and heather's been really impactful for me along with you know traditional therapy i've talked a lot about but it's really been just taking a deeper look at myself and stop looking at what other people are doing yeah vince's addiction had nothing to do with me vince's addiction had everything to do with vince mm-hmm. and not stacy You know, so it's like knowing that I need to look at myself. That's been what's been the most helpful, the most hard, but the most helpful. We've, we talked about this yesterday after my second relationship, I was single, single for two years. I didn't occupy attention. I didn't give attention. I wasn't on apps. I, I sat in silence with myself and it was hard as fuck. 
and I thought I was great. And then my grandma died. And that really was the universe like, oh, bitch, you think you're good. Let me pull this safety net out from under you. My grandma is that person for all of us. All, I think nine of us, my grandma was that person. So pulling that safety net out and really making me look at, you know, and then losing that friend that I was, you know, this, this man was like, he, he, that person filled in for me when my brothers did not. And, you know, losing him and that was hard. So it's, that's really been what it's been. It's like you said, it's ebbs and flows. It's life process. It's, you know, friendships and relationships changing and shifting into a bad place or a good place or whatever it's been. It's been me like sitting in my silence and coping in a positive way. Yeah. It's literally been me saying no to people when they're like, come out. I live where I could throw a rock at four different bars and saying, no, I, I can't, I, I don't trust myself to go out with you because I'm going to get blacked out because I had a really negative thought or a bad memory today, or I got into an argument with my mom or whatever it was. And if I go out, I'm going to get too fucked up. So I'm, I need to say no and stay home. That's yeah. what it's been. Sit with those it's feelings. Good. Yeah. And it's really hard. I feel you. You it's, know that that's been my really journey hard. the last year and a half. So yeah, it's, it, it's the most uncomfortable thing is to sit with yourself. Yeah. It's easy to like, both of us have talked about this uh, so much about just being fixers and we want to fix everything, but that's distracting us from looking inward and at ourselves and like, okay, what do we need to fix in here or at least sit with? And it's much easier to be like, Oh, well here's an easy fix for this person or what's going on there. Like easy peasy lemon squeezy. Let's yeah. just like well, God, deal can with you that. Imagine how like annoying it, I, I mean, I'm sure my brother could be the first one to account. Like it's so annoying being my family member. Cause I'm always like, yeah, Vince, like you're doing CrossFit. Like I love this healthy coping. Like he's recently gone to CrossFit with the last year mm-hmm. and I, and he's about it. He's about this. And you've always been like that. I remember even when you were in on drugs, like he's riding his bike 50 miles, right? Like I remember being well, hammered he had the when he lived in, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Well, even so, there's a lot of other people doing that right now too. They well, have I know, but before. like even when you lived in Huntington Beach, I remember him getting into like a push-up contest with somebody like hammered. Like he's physically always. Who has a long drug addiction and looks like this? It's okay, annoying. Well, I mean, it's catching up real quick. But you know what I mean? <laughs> like, like my yeah, my whenever back. he, you know, this healthy coping mechanism, this love he's found for CrossFit, I'm like texting him like, yes, like Bob, and he's, I'm sure there's days he's looking at his phone like, Stacey, shut the fuck no, up. No, I mean, no, because you, like you were saying a little bit ago, like you've always felt like you've had this, you know, you've had to be a certain person so we can depend on you. And you have been, honestly, yeah. for, for everybody in the fa- our family. You know, you've always been the strong one. And you've always you taken care of business. And if you want to somebody to depend dependable, you can call Stacy because she's going to be dependable. And she's going to get it done. And with flair, you know, it's going to happen. So <laughs> with flair, th- that is, oh, that is you. show up with glitter. <laughs> that is you. And it's a uh, I don't know what I would do without you. And, and it was, well, I think probably speak for everybody in our family. Yeah. And, I mean, and, mom and always, same, though. I, I know I get it. But I'm just saying, like, um, that's who you are. And that's we love that. Yeah. When we and we were saying before we started recording how like every um, each one of us you know there's so many of us just five kids and my mom we all play a role right like yeah. Mikey my little brother's super sensitive I mean it's the most sensitive out all of us and he he kind of plays that role of like you know he's now making more money and he's like my sister had the baby but he's, he's super like, strong also in the sense of uh, he's if he's determined mm-hmm. to do something and he believes in it then he will try 110 percent to do it Mm -hmm. even if it is like you know creating this marijuana empire (laughs) literally literally and like amanda she's so disciplined my sister for the longest time would get up every morning early to stretch because she has like you know kind of a lanky body like a long torso and her joints would hurt so she would like i need to get up early i need to stretch she's disciplined with her dog walking she's very disciplined vince is like the man in everyone's life literally like i don't know why my sister and i can't pick men that know how to use a fucking (laughs) drill but like my brother like he's fixing the brakes on my ex's car because my ex couldn't do it or we, afford we, it you know we, and we replaced the, uh, the actual i mean not the actual but the um, you replaced everything you tuned yeah. his car up too like he literally does if i need a shelf hung you know if i need anything like vince is the dependable he's dependable as well to be able to do the things that i'm like i'm not like you two ultra to women know. yeah you two <laughs> ultra you. women who are like i want to learn how to fucking do woodworking so i'm gonna build a plant you know this is these two <laughs> i'm like, like that. Meh. i'm gonna call my brother he's gonna do that yeah. shit for me like you know and so I, know, I never I, said i was good at any of that i just try <laughs> and, and i have no problem doing that with for them like yeah he I like I, there's days well, when i ask like him to do stuff he doesn't yeah, want like to do it. and he my, does it yeah it's my love it. language it totally is i could tell when i'm like will you change my own he's like oh, yeah definitely what let's go to the i store would love and, to do know. that 
Yeah, yeah. I just it would nothing would bring me more joy. Degrees <laughs> outside. <laughs> so what like how do you what are some like ending thoughts that you you guys would like to to discuss as we close this we're closing, episode? We're, we're closing it. Okay. I just wanted to tell one story real quick. My dad. Yeah. yeah. Like this is and good. It thing. doesn't have to be quick. You yeah. have time. So he's this kind of person. He's the bad person where we have to go to a father son team day and he doesn't even show up. Okay. Which broke my heart. Okay. Yeah. Those are the things that destroy you. He did that twice, but he's also the person that when he decides to show up the third year, um, you get in his El Camino, but we didn't leave the, the whole group of people. They're in vans ready to go up to the hills and shoot BB guns and do all these little, you know, boy activities with arrows and stuff. And they're like, are you, you good? And I'm like, and there's a third year in a row. And I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. You know, and I'm ready to ball, you know, and they take off and then I start crying and I start walking back to my grandma's house and he turns the corner and he's like, come on, get in the car, get in the car. We're going to go. And I was like, no, they're already gone. You know, he says, get in the car. We're going to go. We're going to do our thing. So I get in the car. And it's like an hour away, but he knows every street, and back road, freaking <laughs> freak river. Yeah. So we get up to the, uh, we get there and there's a big gate. You walk, you drive in this dude parks, right? And he goes, come on, let's go. And I'm like, okay. So we are walking, we're hustling along and he goes, and I'm like, there's a sign in booth right there, dad. He's like, nah, I'm no sign in booth. <laughs> Keep going. Let's go. Come on. We're walking straight through all the activities. And I'm like, where the hell are we going in my head? I'm like, what the fuck? You know? He knew. And everybody's looking at us. Oh, yeah. He did. And he's like, we're going to make you a man today. Because he always told me, like, I'm going to drop you off in the mountains one day and you got to make it back by yourself. Yeah. That was that You'll thing. be a man. And I was like, oh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> no, okay. No, I was, about, I, was, sure. I was like, yeah, I wouldn't be a, I'm a mountain. I mean, he wrote, like, on one of my little kid essays or whatever, you know, I'm, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm going to be a mountain man. Yeah. <laughs> he used to call me trailblazing woman. Yeah. So we, we get there and he's, we were cutting through all the activities and stuff and we head straight to the back of this property and we're up in like uh like jackson kind of the mount, up foothills and he takes the barbed wire fence and he opens it up and he goes go and i'm like what you just go and so i went through and then he comes behind me and he goes you got to keep up with me because that's that's the mission for today and i'm like what <laughs> everything was extra yeah so he's like hustling through the through this little foothill like rocks and stuff and and i'm like I keep trying to keep up with them and in i don't know where we ended up but we were like <laughs> i think he just got lost honestly <laughs> and because we didn't get back because what he's like on one right and we got lost or something because i'm like yeah what are we doing he goes just follow me and i think he's just trying to find his way back to the, where we were and we finally got back i mean literally we were walking around for probably an hour and a half two hours just everywhere in the foothills and we get back and everybody's gone all the things closed up there's like one building there it's locked up look like a deserted area and then i'm like oh my gosh how are we gonna get out because the big gate was shut too okay he drove an el camino i feel like this is where we have anxiety because we never knew what was gonna happen never knew so lowered el camino and i'm like we're we're screwed you know he goes get in the car we're fine we get in the mm -hmm. he goes to the gate and now there's this hill on the side of the gate goes straight down into a freaking creek and this dude straight up goes in a low rider el camino down this hill and and goes in the creek and heads back up the other side of the hill and makes it and drives off like he had no bit of like doubt in his head that he wasn't going to be able to do he already this had that and i'm out. yeah Character. i'm tripping out i'm like what and he was good just kept on driving and i'm like what the hell just happened <laughs> that was my dad yeah yeah that's also just, that's also one story. Also, uh, my we used to go to Dillon Beach a lot. Like we have a lot of great members of Dillon mm -hmm. Beach. He used to do this really fun Fourth of July. They did a big bonfire. Yeah. I mean, it was to be honest, like low key terrifying because yeah, I remember people just throwing fireworks in the bonfire. Bombs, yeah, and then oh just going. Yeah, yeah, they don't do it anymore. I wonder why. <laughs> but we had so many a great memories yeah, there. Driving up there, yeah. Dustin and I. Oh, my brother. No my room. dad would literally pack. He had an El Camino. <laughs> It was my dad, me in the middle, my stepmom, and then Vince got to bring like a friend, Dustin, it was Dustin, Dustin or, or Aaron, Aaron Zier. Yeah, but he put a mattress. Yeah, Should and pack, mattress. pack around them. And my job was to knock on the window when we saw cops, yeah, so that they knew down. to stay down. Well, we have our Walkmans on, listening to like Easy E. Yeah, you know that from here, Dillon Beach is what two and a half hours. Yeah, and he would turn Easily. the corners. And the mattress was so high, it was like almost flush with the top of the the, the truck. So if he if I would have stood right out the hell, that, yeah, yeah. He would just do. He remember that old like vinyl tent he had. It was he used duct tape for everything. Yeah, I right. still duct have tape. one of his pullovers. Duct tape sticks and yeah. black tape too. Yeah, yeah, duct like it was duct taped. It was before the, zip instead ties. of stitching it, it was duct taped. He just was a character, and everything he did, he was a character. I have kind of not like a similar story, but it was the same thing. Like 
you know, out of five of my softball tournaments, he showed up to one, but the one he showed up to was, you know, an hour and a half away and he made everybody on the team family tacos and everybody's like, Oh, you know, like he wasn't always consistent, but when he was there, it, it, it was his personality was big enough that you forgot the other four Just, times, yeah, which is kind of a, like a fucked up way of saying shit, but it's, that's what it was. His personality was so big. It made you forget about some of the bad times, you know? And or, or how about when we were, when we went to, uh, was it Acropolis or something more up there where Angelie and Uncle Wayne had their cabin? Twain Hart? No, I don't, I think, was it Twain Hart? It's Twain Hart, yeah. Okay, so we're coming back, you know, and it's oh, way I'm so out there. I was so pissed about it, this. Huh? I was so pissed about we're this. We're way out there in the mountains, yeah, and we're driving along, and we stopped at this, like, isolated gas station out in the middle of nowhere, and we're pulling in. Well, you were, like, 26 yeah. at the time. No, no, cause, no. Because no, I, I was, was Marina. Yeah, because I was, we drove I was 17, Jeep. so you were 22. Yeah, so we get there to this gas station, we're pulling in to get gas, and I'm like, dude, man. I look over and I'm like, what the fuck? And my dad's right there mm-hmm. for putting in gas in El Camino. I'm like, what are you doing here? Like, what the? <laughs> he's like, I just went to go see a friend over here, you know? I'm like, what the hell? Like, he was everywhere. <laughs> then he, proce- then he, he proceeds everywhere. to tell my mom that I had a party while she oh, was out of town. Oh, ratted her out. Rat- snitch. I was so mad. I called him. I said, why? why would you do that? He's like, what? I said, I am grounded <laughs> because you told mom that I had a party. And he's like, oh, she don't care. I'm like, no, I'm grounded. <laughs> like randomly sees my mom at this gas station, my brother, my mom. Did you have a party? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I wouldn't she would have never known. You're all my dad's I not I was not dumb enough to put the cans in the trash. I took the cans yeah. with me somewhere else. Yeah. He she would have never known. I like told my mom I had there to work. It was a second location. Yeah, <laughs> always. I told my mom I had to work. She would have never known. I got to stay home by myself. I was like, hey, I had a party every day, all day, yeah, all did. night. Like and he told on me. I wasn't there. I was, I was over there. Yeah. Vince, and, Vince actually went on the vacation. Yeah. Did <laughs> Another time uh, we're in Jackson and he, we do this like, you know, my dad would just free spirit drive. Let's go on a cruise. Okay, cool. And he would literally stop in all the traffic just to move to a cow. I was on the side of the road. Huh? <laughs> he go. He thinks he, he, th- he could talk to cows, cows and hawks. And hawks. Yeah. Yep. My friend. He would yep. always say that. That's all what he would yeah. always say. My friend. But we're, we we're yeah. driving and I was always with him. She wasn't with him this time. And sometimes I would have to drive because he would get drunk. But this particular time we we're driving along and he goes, let's go down this road. And we turn down the road and it's this windy road. It goes in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, I don't know, dad, it said private property, you know, and he's like, he didn't care. So we're going along and we cruise up and all of a sudden there's three cowboy looking dudes with guns, shotguns. Oh, sh- yeah. So we're rolling up to him and I'm like, oh, my, we're about to die. And they come up to the window and they say, like, what the fuck are you doing here? Like, Mexican? And stuff like that. And I'm, like, whispering it. Like, they I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I said, uh, I didn't say anything. I was scared shitless. And my dad, and he just, 15 minutes later, we're in their house <laughs> drink, drinking and eating. I'm eating beef jerky with these guys. And they're his best friend. That's who he was. That's, that's, that's the, that is the perfect way to end it. Because that is literally my dad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he would charm you. He was charismatic and you would be his best friend in 15 minutes. I don't even think it would take that long. No. I yeah. think it's just like to, to like put a bow on this whole thing, right? Is just to see the road that addiction takes people down and that mental illness really plays such a huge role in it. It's like they're, they're not bad people. They mm-hmm. just make horrible choices mm-hmm. and are sometimes, you know, their demons get the best of them and, it's I wish I was older so I could, I could help him because who would he help him? He was just so sad. He was sad, yeah. It was That was the perfect way. He, that song, Tears of a Clown, that really is, that's his song. You know, my mom and my brother and I, I'm sure my stepmom had to really see that side of him that I don't think a lot of people got to see, you know? So I think there's a lot of people, you know, we asked a lot of people to, to give us their best memory and we could do a whole other episode about it. Cause I think everybody we've ever come across has a, a positive, fun, good memory of him. You know? Yeah. The worst well, part I about hope today. The ones that, Sorry. I hope the ones that follow us can share like memories. I would love that. I would love the that. The worst part about today is going to be when I leave and every instant of memory that I have of him is going to go through my head of what I should have talked about. Well, you got to let that go. Cause there's nothing no, you can I know. do. I'm just saying now. like, yeah, you know, all the stuff that, there's a lot of stories. Yeah. And you can always talk about them. Yeah. <laughs> you should share them with Jacqueline. Yeah. yeah. Well. I think that's special too, right? Yeah. But thank you. I, I just want to thank you both for your vulnerability. And I know that um, this unfortunately isn't a unique story that there's so many stories mm-hmm. of alcoholism, 
that has led down this path, the same path where there was a ton of hurt and a ton of un, un, uh, uh, things that you can't even imagine. Um, and then these beautiful stories of just this human being that, you know, brought you both into this world. And so thank yeah. you both. Thank you. A beautiful mess. Yes. Life is a beautiful mess. A beautiful mess.